We are still in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we kicked off Hebrews chapter 2 last week, and so we're going to wrap it up this week. Uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 5 all the way to verse 18. And so if you have a Bible, you can meet me there. Otherwise, it'll be up on the screen as we make our way through it. Permit me to pray uh, before we jump into the text this morning. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me. Uh, that God would do that which only he can do, which is to save many. And so, Father God, we thank you for who you are. Uh, we are so thankful that you are seated on your throne and that you are fully in control. You're not pacing back and forth, wondering what's going on. Uh, nothing has taken you by surprise. And so we can boldly approach the throne of grace on that truth. Father, I ask that you would speak to us this morning. I ask that my words would submit to yours and that my heart would submit to yours. Would you open us up so that we might uh, fully grasp what it is that you have for us? Uh, to, it makes much of you, and it helps us to understand how we are to navigate this life here on earth. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, so those things you have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king, you are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name, we pray. Amen. Now, up until now, the writer of Hebrews has been communicating to us about the supremacy of Jesus, about how Jesus is superior to everything, even the angels. He is more powerful, more majestic, more glorious than any angel. He is better than everything. That's what the writer of Hebrews has been, been laying before us, verse after verse after verse. He's pointing us to the supremacy of Christ. But then he switches gears, almost like going from gear six to gear one while moving at 140 kilometers per hour. And if any of you have ever done that, um, that is like it's dangerous. Don't, don't, don't do that, right? But, but he does that here in the text he shifts gears on us. And he does this because the writer of Hebrews doesn't want us to, to exalt Jesus as deity so much so that we end up forgetting that he was fully man. He, he's been making the point verse after verse that like Jesus is the son of God. He is glorious. He is superior to everything. And then he changes gears and he goes, no, but hold on. I, I, I don't want you to forget that he was also fully man. You see, we can run the danger of only seeing Jesus as deity and forgetting about his humanity. But the Bible reveals to us that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. Well, like I said, up until now, we've been presented with the deity of Jesus. Now the writer of Hebrews begins to unpack the humanity of Jesus. A and then he connects Jesus' humanity to our humanity. And so let's start by reading verse 5. It says, For he has not subjected to the angels the world to come that we are talking about. Uh, what the writer here is telling us is that God never gave angels the kind of dominion man originally had over the earth. Right? That, that's how he changes gears, by going, okay, I, I want to talk to you about how Jesus, yes, he's superior to the angels, but, but, but I, I want you to understand that that God has never, has never given the angels the kind of dominion that was given originally to humanity. We see this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 30. Let me read it to you. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and the whole earth and the creatures that crawl over the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, hashtag more, fill the earth and subdue it. And then he says, rule 
the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. For all of the wildlife of the earth and for every bird of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having breath of life in it, so I've given every green plant for food and it was so. We, we were given dominion. We were given authority. This has never been given to any angels. Angels do not have dominion over this world or in the world to come. They have never been given anything to rule. So as, as amazing as you would think of an angel, the, the power and the majesty and the glory, they were never given anything to rule. We were. Little side note here, just another reason to why Satan hates you. So, so many of us, we, 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 we play with sin, like, you know, it's, oh, buddy, buddy, he's going to get me the things that I No, 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 no. The thief comes only, Jesus says. Yeah. Only. And this is one of the reasons that I believe Satan hates us. With all the power and the majesty that he had, and, and then to, to look at humans and go, seriously? Them. Let me uh, listen to, to what Psalm 8 says about us, about humans. Listen to what Psalm 8 says. And the writer actually goes and quotes a piece of Psalm 8 in Hebrews 2. But Psalm 8 reads as follows. It says, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All the sheep and oxen as well as the animals in the wild and the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. The psalmist here is going, I, I just, I, I can't believe it. Like, like everything that you have created and yet you take time to mold and shape man. You care for him, they, 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 you then give him authority and dominion. You crown him with glory and honor. The psalm praises God for his amazing power and creation while marveling at the idea that such a divine being would give any further thought to something as frail and limited as man. But back to Hebrews, verse 6. But someone somewhere has testified. I love the fact that he says that, right? I mean, someone somewhere said, we've read Hebrews 1 and we've seen you quote psalm after psalm after psalm. You know who wrote this psalm and you know exactly where it is. But what I think he's doing is he's identifying himself with the someone somewhere crowd, of which there are many in here, you know? It's like, I know, so, no, where is it? Some, someone said, somewhere, somewhere. He's just, I, I love the fact that he does that, but he knows, he knows. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. What he's doing is he's, he's connecting our humanity to Jesus' humanity while also pointing to the humility of Jesus. I mean, can you imagine the day that this was communicated to the angels and all of heaven that, that Jesus, fully God, would take on flesh and blood? I want you to think about that for a moment. Th these are the angels who are like, man, we are, we are fully aware of who Jesus is. Yeah. Yeah. Second person of the Trinity. And you're going you're gonna to do what? Like, we, we get humanity. You're going to do What? that he would become fully man. Yes. Now hear me, not giving up his deity, yeah. but that humanity would be added to his deity. 
See, so many of us, we, 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 we compartmentalize, like we go, you know what, okay, hold on. Uh, when Jesus came down from heaven to earth, what he did is he gave up his deity. No, no, he didn't. In humility, he added humanity to his divinity. And that, that should blow our minds. It should blow our minds because, because why? Why on earth would God do this? In fact, this is what separates us from every other religion. That he's not in some corner office on the top floor shouting orders to us. No, no, no. He puts on flesh, comes down the elevator, and then mingles with us on the streets. He embraces humanity. He, for a short while, will appear a little lower than the angels. That's, that's us. He will appear like us. You crowned him with glory and honor. I mean, think of, of humanity's amazing honor here. You crowned him with glory and honor. Adam and Eve were the king and queen of the original creation. God set them in glorious paradise and then walked with them. So, so he creates this, this, this beautiful paradise and, and then he gives them authority and, and, and dominion. He, he, he crowns them with glory made in his image and then he goes, you know what? I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to be with you. The writer of Hebrews then says, don't just consider humanity's honor, but consider their amazing authority. Verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 2 says, and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. I know it sounds like a tongue twister, but let me tell you what he's saying. He's telling us that God's original plan for us, for humanity, was amazing. If the plan had not been disrupted by us and had been carried out, we, the descendants of Adam, would be living in this amazing position of honor and authority. A world of kings and queens. The message to the world is that though we may look to the universe and marvel, which we do, Though we may look to the depth of the ocean and wonder, which we do. If we look at the book of Hebrews, though they look to the angels and are in awe. With all of this, if we ever feel ourselves to be insignificant, the writer of Hebrews is telling us we are not. We are not. We are made in God's image. And he cares for each one of us more than we could ever imagine. But, but we've got to understand the cross. And to understand the cross, we've got to understand Jesus' humanity. And to understand Jesus' humanity, we've got to understand Jesus' divinity. It's all connected. But let's be honest. Many days I feel insignificant. Kings and queens, honor and dominion. I mean, we turn on the news and we don't see that. If we look in the mirror and we just examine our own lives, we don't feel that way. We don't feel like royalty. And it doesn't feel like we have honor and dominion. The world around us is in chaos. It's anarchy everywhere. Even nature feels like it's attacking us at times. If it's not world leaders or politicians attacking one another, it's natural disasters taking the lives of people. If it's not that, then it's high tax rates, increasing inflation, load shedding, Petrol increased prices, and murder, and adultery, addictions, depression. The list goes on and on and on and on. It doesn't feel like we're royalty. It doesn't feel like we have dominion or authority. 
And so where is the promise of Genesis 1? Where? Where is the promise of Genesis 1? What happened to God's original plan for humanity? Well, I, I alluded to it when I said we disrupted God's amazing plan for us. We. I said it a couple of weeks ago. You know, in a really bad breakup when you're communicating to the other person, and you're going, you know what, it's, it's not you, it's, it's me. But, but when talking about God's original plan for humanity, God is looking at us and saying, it's you. It's you. Where is the promise of Genesis 1? You. Why all the chaos? Why all the you? When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden, sin entered the world, and consequently our God-given honor went into the toilet. And our God-given dominion became twisted. Humanity's reign and rule over creation has through the centuries become an absolute cosmic disaster. Let's just be honest. It is a cosmic disaster. So with this devastating reality, what are we then to do? What are we then to do? The writer of Hebrews says in verse 9, but we do see Jesus. Amen. But we do see Jesus. He is our cosmic solution. See, through Jesus, man can regain the honor and dominion originally intended for us. We can read Revelation chapter 1 together. It says, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. R remember, in the garden, they honor, glory, like they, they had it all. Authority, dominion, they had it all. And they walked with God. There was no need for a mediator. They had direct access to God. When sin entered the world, we lost all of it. This is why we need priests or why we needed priests. Was, was they would stand in the gap between humanity and God. They would mediate on our behalf. We've seen it before and we'll continue to see it throughout the book of Hebrews. Jesus comes as the final priest, the high priest. And so in him shedding his blood, he goes, there's no need for, for human priests anymore. No need for human priests. It's through Jesus we regain the honor and dominion originally intended for us. And that we are made a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. Re Revelation 5 says this, and they sang a new song. Amen. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. Transcultural. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Jesus is our cosmic solution. Yes. So the question is, do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus? There are so many things we will not understand until we see Jesus. Yes. The answers to life's most difficult questions are not found in answering why, they are found in answering who. Yeah. And that who has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. This is why the writer of Hebrews goes, but we see Jesus. In this cosmic disaster, in this chaos and anarchy and confusion, you know what? 
it's okay because we see Jesus. See, Jesus is the one who loves sinners and died for them. The one who loved you and died for you. See him as your savior. See him as your master. See him as your friend. See him as your older brother. See him as your healer. See him as your protector. See him as your provider. See him at home and at work and where you play. Not just on a Sunday here, but you got to see him in all of life. See Jesus. But we do see Jesus. Made lower than the angels for a short while so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone. Crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. See, if God the Son did not add humanity to his deity and in his humanity be made lower than the angels, then he could never experience the suffering of death on our behalf. It's all connected. This tells us that that the suffering that Jesus went through, the tasting of death, that, that that was only the introduction to being crowned with glory and honor. It was only the introduction Friends, we're, we're about to celebrate Easter Sunday. And, and I use that word intentionally, celebrate. Yeah. Because there is a lot to celebrate. But, but, but here's the thing. We can't celebrate Easter Sunday without recognizing Good Friday. Yes. You, you, you just can't. The, the writer of Hebrews is like that guy who stands at the side of the road with a board trying to, to, to get our attention. He's probably wearing a bright, glowing 70s tracksuit with multicolored LED lights all around him. Friends, he's probably wearing Crocs, right? He's doing whatever it takes to get people's attention, right? However weird he must look, he'll do it. He's wearing Crocs. And on the sign, he's going, guys, his death, his death, his death was meant so that we might have life. He's trying to get our attention. But we're not to stop at the introduction, we're to keep reading. In fact, we're to read to the end. We get the privilege as the church living in this era to be able to have everything revealed to us. So so, so don't just read the introduction, read everything. Yes, the introduction is he clothed himself in humanity and he came and lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we all deserve. We recognize the cross but we also recognize the crown, that that the story doesn't end on Friday, that he rose from the grave, and and we've got to put those two together. But you know what many of us do? We pick one and then we run with it. We we run with it, So, so we'll go, made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, okay. Good Friday. That's speaking about the cross. I'm just like, I'm going to take that and I'm just going to run with it, separate it from everything else. You know what ends up happening? Is that yes, you get suffering. You do. You fully grasp it. You understand it. But, but then you struggle to pray in expectation for God to bring life to things. You, you, you no longer see miracles. You no longer see what God is doing when he brings life and life to the full because you're just so stuck on the cross. But then there's another camp. But we do see Jesus skip everything else, crowned with glory and honor. And then they're like, yeah, I know there's some stuff there, but but crowned with glory and honor. So, So all you see is Easter Sunday. And then you separate everything else from it. So so you're constantly living in expectation. God's going to do something. God's going to move. God's going to bring life. God's going to heal. He's going to provide. He's going to do it all. And then the moment you run into a little bit of suffering, everything falls apart. Because you have no handles. You have no theology. You have no understanding. Like, you you don't even know where to anchor this. You're just going, God, what on earth? You you look to the heavens and you make a fist. And you go, how dare you? 
See, we've got to understand it. The, the fullness of the gospel. Many of us are carrying an incomplete gospel. And an incomplete gospel lacks power. You, you cannot say all of God's promises are yes and amen with an incomplete gospel. And the writer of Hebrews, I think he's recognizing that because he's going glory, majesty, superior, supremacy. And then he's going, hold on. I don't want an overdeveloped understanding of this while lacking the suffering that Jesus went through, which was for our good. He brings it together. Verse 10, he says, for in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, how deep the father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Let's be honest, friends. We, we don't want to read that kind of stuff. I, I, perfect through suffering. Nah, hold on. Hold on. But my hope is that you see the connection. If we want to enter into the glory as sons and daughters, we must receive his perfect suffering. We must receive his perfect suffering. Verse 11, for the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. So, so you, can't, you, can't, you can't separate yourself from that aspect of Jesus and then still look to God and go, Father. You can't. Whether it's the cross or the crown, whether it's the suffering or the life. This is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. He quotes Psalm 22. Again, I will trust in him, Isaiah 8. And again, here I am with the children of God, the children God gave me, Isaiah 8 again. So he goes back to the Old Testament, and he goes, hey, here's, here's what Jesus is doing. Here's what he's doing. He's saying, because you, you get the gospel, you get the fullness of the gospel, I will not be ashamed to call you brothers and sisters. In fact, I, I, will, what, what is, I will proclaim your name. That'd be interesting, writing a song about, about us. Proclaiming your name to our brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. I, I hope you're hearing the identification to us that Jesus declares. He's saying, I am with them and they are with me. Again, guys, can you imagine what's going on in heaven? Think about this for a moment. Because the angels, they understand us. They do. And they understand Jesus. And they're going, and so you, and with them, are you sure? You know, probably an angel like pulling Jesus aside. I don't think Peter was the first person to pull Jesus aside and be like, hold on, hold on, Jesus. Look, I trust you. I think you are, I worship you. I, but have you seen One? And you, same WhatsApp group, you and One. How? By putting on flesh. By walking the earth. By understanding humanity. He identifies himself with us. And, and the, the, the privilege and the benefit and the joy. Friends, I don't think we fully understand it. Let me, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was coming back from Ethiopia. Many of you know about that. And, uh, and I was sitting on the plane and I got the privilege to sit next to His Excellency, the President of Botswana, and Her Excellency, the First Lady. Now, before you guys start thinking, oh, no, oh I rode it, traveling <laughs> first class. No. House. There, there, we, there we go, there we go. Make sure this part is definitely recorded. I was in economy, and yet I was sitting next to them. So that's a whole nother story that I want to tell. Friends, if I, 
One day, if, if I get the privilege of writing a book, I'm gonna put all this stuff in there. Apps, it blew my mind, the conversation, I got to share my, my faith, the gospel, my, my testimony was absolutely incredible. And so we're having this conversation going back and forth and, um, and then the, 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 the air hostess, is that how you say it? Yeah. Comes up and, and engages them and the whole time I was trying to get them to move up to, to, to first class, to business class. And they were like, no, 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 no. We, uh, we, we, we booked these tickets with intention. All right, all right. Again, a whole nother story for another day. Um, and then he goes, but plus we also don't want to go up front because we're hanging with our friend, One. Wow. F- firstly, I went. <laughs> yeah. Just a little inside. I mean, outside I was cool and calm and like you, but inside I was doing a little shuffle. But then the level of service completely changed towards me. Not because of anything that I did. Me, I was still on it, the same on it. But but because they identified themselves with, like, no, no, we're, we're, we're together. If we fully understand who Jesus is, and he looks to us and he says, no, these are my brothers and my sisters. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of what he has done. So what do we do? We we simply surrender. We simply receive. We acknowledge that we are sinful and in desperate need of a savior. And just like that, we get everything, everything. There is great honor and glory in partaking in and with Jesus. Jesus says he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Friends, when, when, when Satan whispers in your ear, shame, shame, shame. Because our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we hear him yelling, family, family, family. That, that's, that's the difference here. You see, the the shame we feel is because of the things that we have done. Satan knows the things that we have done, and and, and so in many ways, he's right to say that to us. The honor and the glory we feel and experience is because of what he has done. And so you go, Satan, I hear you, but let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about who he is and what he's done for me. He is not ashamed to call me brother or sister. I get the fullness of the gospel. I recognize that Good Friday was necessary so that we might have Easter Sunday. He is our risen king. You have no hold on me, no authority over me, crowned in glory and honor. Verse 14. I'll close this out on this. Ben can come up. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shares in these, so that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death. That is the devil. Just in case you're going, "Mm, I wonder who this could be, you know, is this like one of those things we go home and we figure it out and put some cards out and we like, it's like a a Sherlock Holmes detective. No, 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 no. He goes, no, don't waste time. Let me just tell you, that is the devil and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. Death has no hold on me. For those who are in Christ, death has no hold on you. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help the angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, fully man. Why? The writer of Hebrews tells us, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God and to make atonement for the sins of the people. See, the high priest back then wore a breastplate with stones engraved with the names of the tribes of Israel on both his chest and his shoulders. The high priest was therefore in constant sympathy with the people of God. That's what it meant. Carrying them on his heart and on his shoulders. Mm. 
But, but remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago that, the, that the, the, the sacrifice that the high priest would have to make, he'd make it once a year on the Day of Atonement. He'd have to do it every single year because it was never enough. Jesus did not wear the high priest's breastplate. But the wound in his chest, the compassion, the splachnism, the compassion, where he looks to the world and he goes, they are like sheep without a shepherd. So what is the solution to this cosmic disaster? He goes, I will step in. I will come and meet them where they are. His chest, his heart beats for us. And then on the cross, on his shoulders, is the evidence of his love for us. His finished work. Verse 18 says, For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to to help those who are tempted. We're going to be told later that he was tempted just like us, but he never sinned. That's the difference. But he was tempted. Because Jesus added humanity to his deity and experienced human suffering, he can help us when we are tempted. Because he goes, I know what you're going through. I understand that you're hungry, that you're thirsty, that you're longing for a relationship, that you are alone, that you feel that you've been abandoned. That, that I get it. I get all of that. But you know what? I, I didn't sin. I did not sin. I trusted the Father. He understands what we're going through. The greater you must give up, the greater the temptation. The greater that you must give up, the greater the temptation. No one has given up more than Jesus. That's why Satan wanted, with everything, wanted to bring him down. But he couldn't. The promise here is not the removal of the temptation, but the help to get through the temptation and not sin. It's to not give in. Jesus drew near to humanity so that he could help us through our times of trial, temptation, and struggle. He is close to us. And that made, was made possible because he, of his humanity, he put on flesh and blood. He gets it. But he's also fully God. And so if you're here this morning and you're just going, I, I need to feel Jesus close to me. I feel isolated, I feel alone, I feel abandoned, I feel, I feel like I'm wrestling, I feel like the, 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 the waves of this world are, are tossing me back and forth. And I Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. He is close. Like I said, he is not sitting somewhere in a corner office. He is close. He knows everything that you're going through. He's praying for you by name. My good friend, Joey, some of you know him. He's an exceptional rugby coach. Great rugby player in his heydays, but an amazing rugby coach. He was with us for a couple of years and got an amazing opportunity to go be one of the head coaches in Durban with the Sharks. What I love about Joey is that when he's coaching, he's not in the box somewhere. And, and I get why some of them do that. I think there's a strategic reason for it. But, but he, you won't see him in the box with the headset on yelling to guys on the field. No, you'll see Joey right on the field. As close as he legally can. And, and you'll see him bend down and, and, and speak to the players and, and yell to them and encourage them and go, keep going. Like, especially when times are hard because that's when we need it the most. He he draws near to them as as close as he can and goes, keep going. Because it gets hard on the field. Especially when when illegal things are happening. 
when you're getting pushed and shoved and it's unfair. You know what the temptation is in those moments? To go, who do you think you are? It's to grab people by the throat. It's begin to manipulate because we want to be in control. We have a coach who goes, hey, don't do that. Don't give in. Look at me. I'm right here. Everything that you need is right here. I am right there with you. And I have gone through everything that you are going through. All the bad, I've gone through them. Oh, my name has been through the mud. I've been lied on, abandoned. But because my eyes were on God the Father, I was able to get through it. And so you keep your eyes on me and you'll be able to get through it. Draw near to him. He draws near to you. And so, Father God, I pray for each and every single person in this room this morning. Whatever people are wrestling through, whatever's keeping them up late at night, God, you know. You know every situation, every circumstance. You know it in detail. You know every single emotion. You know every fear. The Bible tells us that we have not been given a spirit of fear, but, but one of love and power and, and self-control, that we can, we can trust you, that we can anchor ourselves in you. And so I pray for the folks in here who, they have not surrendered their lives to you. They, in many ways, are, are trying to figure this stuff out on their own. Lord, I pray that they would recognize the frailty of their own humanity. And in doing so, surrender themselves to you. To put their trust in you. Everything, heart, mind, and soul. Father, I pray that they would experience life and life to the full because that's what you promise us. But it's only when we see Jesus as Savior, as Lord, as friend, as the one who has gone before us, the one who is ahead of us, as the one who is with us side by side, as the one who protects us, who provides for us, who heals us, who restores us. And so Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would take hold of people and and do a massive work in them, that they would leave completely transformed to how they came in. I pray against distractions. The, the, The devil in this very moment is whispering, don't believe that don't trust in that take control of your own life you're the master of your own destiny but all of that is a lie he is the father of lies and we call him out and so with the blood of Jesus just cover us all you are faithful when we are faithless it's your loving kindness that leads us to repentance and so God would would we be in awe and wonder of you and what you have done and what you have accomplished for us So even now as we reflect and and sing and listen to words being sung and then we together sing as brothers and sisters, God, I, I pray that we would do so with the full gospel in mind. Our risen King tasted death for everyone.